Jerry Oliver is a professor of practice at the School of Public Affairs and uh, academic director for the Master of Public Safety, Leadership and Administration, which is part of the Watts College at ASU. Uh, Jerry has an undergraduate degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in public administration, both from ASU. He was born and raised in Phoenix, and he started out as a junior officer on the street with the Phoenix Police Department, rising to the level of assistant chief of police before leaving uh, Arizona to become the chief of police in Pasadena, California, Richmond, Virginia, and Detroit, Michigan. The format is all question and answer. I'm going to start it out asking Jerry a few questions. I wanted to just add a few more things about my history that might be relevant to some of the conversation that we will have, the Q&A that we'll have, because um, in, in all honesty, this should be an enlightening but an uncomfortable conversation uh, between uh, all of us Rotarians who really spend our lives trying to do good. So uh, I was, as Brooks said, I was born here in Phoenix. I'm a native Phoenician. I was born in the 40s. Uh, I, in the 40s and the 50s, as any of you that's sort of in my cohort group, in my age group would know, that that's during the height in Arizona of the Jim Crow era. And uh, I won't educate you about Jim Crow other than to say that that was um, a period of time when there was really a lot of separation between the races and it was intentional and it was at times uh, very mean and um, at times I think totally unfair. It is what the systems that we're still dealing with come out of, Jim Crow. And so I grew up here in, in Phoenix in the 50s and also experienced the turbulent 60s. And uh, for some of you, that's before you came along, but the 60s was a period of time when we had three assassinations of very important people in this country, President Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. It was a time of voting rights acts. Uh, it was a time of uh, civil rights legislation. It was a time of riots after Martin Luther King was killed. Um, it was a time of turbulence in this country that we probably have not seen um, since, even with the times that we're having now. And um, in that period of time, uh, I came along, I guess I came uh, into my own, or as people say sometimes, that uh, that's when I grew into adulthood. Uh, I graduated from Phoenix Union High School, which is right downtown Phoenix now where ASU is. I was uh, graduated 10th in my class. Phoenix Union High School had just recently, in 1965 or in 1961, just recently integrated and it closed down Carver High School. So I was part of the first groups of students that went to Phoenix Union High School um, and helped to cause what was known then as white flight from downtown Phoenix because many of the white families started to move east and north. I also um, <clears throat> graduated, so I said 10th in my class and I went to University of Arizona on an academic scholarship, full academic scholarship. But that was the height of the Vietnam War, also controversial. So my friends and I left uh, University of Arizona and joined the Vietnam War. Um, left the uh, United States and wound up in Vietnam for three and a half years or three years and then came back. And because of, uh, I guess, patriotism, really, I wanted to continue my service. And so uh, I joined the Phoenix Police Department. Uh, and as Brooks said, spent 20 years there, left there as the assistant police chief the executive assistant police chief in Phoenix, uh, went to Memphis as the public safety director, was police chief in Pasadena, California, Richmond, Virginia, and Detroit before returning here and occupying some state level positions uh, with Governor Napolitano 
and now I'm at Arizona State. I wanted to say that, I wanted to give you a little bit more background because um, I'm not telling you about, when I talk, I'm not telling you about something that I read. I'm sharing with you, not speaking on behalf of all black people and not speaking on behalf of all police officers, but as a person who has had an opportunity, a rare opportunity to experience as a African-American male, as a police officer, and then as a police leader across this country, uh, I have some observations that I will share with you. And uh, as I said, hopefully this will be enlightening. Um, if it's not enlightening, hopefully it will be uncomfortable because I think that's when we, as we stir the waters, that's when we'll get waves that will make a difference. So with that, Brooks, I'm, you're on with the first question. Thank you for those very nice words, Jerry. I'm, I'm proud to have you as my friend. Um, and, and thank you so much for agreeing to meet with us tonight. The, the last time you addressed Rotary on police practices, you used the term awful but lawful to describe things that had gone on at uh, Ferguson, Missouri and other places. When I wrote to you a few weeks ago, I used the phrase um, awful but lawful as my subject in my email. But when you wrote back, you changed the subject to awful and unlawful. Can you explain why? You know, Brooks, uh, when I spoke to the, to the Rotary Club before, our Rotary Club before, uh, it was a time actually before uh, many of the innovations, quote unquote, that we've had in law enforcement. It was a time before body cameras that police officers, many police officers now wear. And it was certainly a time before it was uh, video cameras in the hands of citizens uh, or in the hands of others than police officers was prevalent. So uh, we had to take police officers word and their reports for some of the egregious situations that occurred. Uh, we had to go with the police report. We had to wait until uh, those reports came out and uh, it was the reports, police reports, uh, and many times coming from the prosecutor's office uh, that indicated that it was an awful egregious act, but it was one in which was lawful by police officers. Uh, I think with the advent of the cameras and the prevalence of citizens having videotaping and many, and then the videotapes of businesses and so forth, uh, we've learned that uh, many of the situations that we're concerned about not only were egregious, but were illegal. And so that was, that was made plain by uh, the Brianna Taylor, Brianna Taylor situation, but particularly the George Floyd matter of a couple of months back. Uh, that's why I told you that I thought that it had gone from lawful but awful to unlawful and still awful. In fact, uh, beyond awful. So um, that was our, that was the moment that we kind of changed our perspective and our Let me um, ask you another question. As you rose through the ranks, can you relate to us how you began to address the inc instances of racist behavior by your fellow officers and subordinate officers, and what you did once you had command as a chief in the three police departments you commanded to stop that sort of thing? You know, that's a great question because I actually, uh, the one reason why I joined the Phoenix Police Department was because of my history uh, with the Phoenix Police Department. Uh, growing up here and seeing police officers uh, do some really great things on the one hand, but many times as a black person experiencing uh, racist behavior by police officers. Uh, I, uh, I joined the Phoenix Police Department and some of my friends did because we thought that we could make a difference that during that period of time, again, back in the 60s, uh, a lot of riots and a lot of protests and a lot of demonstrations People were marching on the outside of the buildings, throwing rocks at the buildings, breaking windows, doing all the things that some people have done now. 
but it was not changing policing. And so my, I guess my intent for joining the Phoenix PD was to go on the inside, be on the inside and be able to make a difference. And um, as I joined the police department, I discovered that, uh, and I, Brooks, you've heard me say this before, if I had to write a book about policing and the people within policing uh, over my lifetime, the book would be entitled In the Company of Heroes, because I have worked with some of the most amazing individuals, amazing human beings on this planet. Uh, brave people who ran towards danger, all types of danger, when people ran the other direction, when people were frozen in a decision and not knowing what to do, police officers and other public safety people, fire people, uh, ran towards the problem. Um, but I'd also have a chapter in that book that described some of the worst people that should not have ever been police officers and that were abusive and that took advantage of the, of the badge and the reputation and the prestige of policing uh, to demean people and to abuse them. Uh, my, uh, I took the oath and I want to read you, I want to read you guys the oath uh, that you take when you become a police officer. It says, I, in your name, do solemnly swear and affirm that I will be alert and vigilant to enforce the criminal laws of this state, that I will not be influenced in any matter on account of personal bias or prejudice, that I will faithfully and impartially execute the duties of my office as a law enforcement officer according to the best of my skills, my abilities, and judgment. So help me God. I took that very seriously. And I was a very proud person when I graduated from the police academy in early 1970. The Phoenix Police Academy, uh, having achieved that, was one of the finest moments of my life. <clears throat> However, the training officer, the person that I received as my training officer when I left the academy, uh, would be in that chapter among the worst people that should have never been a police officer. Um, I'll just give you this quick story. Uh, on, in the first week, and this was a white officer who had been on the police department for some time at that point, um, during the first week, and I'm in the vehicle, police vehicle with him, um, a call comes out, it's an emergency call at 16th Street in Washington. And if any of you are aware of Phoenix, have been in Phoenix for a while, 16th Street in Washington uh, was a black area with a few black nightclubs and um, black businesses, African-American businesses. And we were about I'd say six blocks away and an emergency traffic call came out. It had to do with some violence occurring there at 16th and one. And my, uh, when I, I'm ready to go, I mean, I've just read to you my charge, which is my oath to do, to problem solve and to do the right thing. And as I started to drive and he was allowing me to drive, drive towards 16th and Washington, um, he said, hey, 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 where are you, where are you going? What are you, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, we're going to drive over to 16th and see what's going on. We need to get there. He said, no, 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 no. No. When calls come out, and he used the N-word, and I'm black, and I'm sitting in the car. He says, when the call comes out at 16th Street in Washington or places where those N-word people hang out, he says, drive slow. Drive, just, he says, you know what? When we get there, because they're all violent, when, though, if something happens, the, the winner will go to jail and the loser will go to the marg and we don't have to screw around with those damn people. Um, that was the, my introduction during the first weeks. And it got worse in many ways from there. That I discovered that, you know, if you're arrested and you're, you are a black male particularly, you were in trouble because some of you might recall people that might be again in my cohort group, you might remember that the 
Phoenix City Jail was on the other side of the Maricopa County building at 2nd Avenue in Washington. The jail was on the fourth floor. And if you weren't abused and beat up before you got to the front desk to get booked, when you got on that elevator to go to the fourth floor where the jail was, you um, had, a little, had a little problem with police. They would find a reason to use their saps and their nightsticks on you in the elevator going to the fourth floor. Um, so a lot of assumptions were made about black people and since the department was mostly white people, I was one of about 15 police officers out of about 2,500, 15 black officers. A lot of assumptions about black people and who they were and black males and uh, how um, they were and how uh, irresponsible and lazy and how they didn't take care of their kids and how they were uh, less civilized and uh, that when there was an arrest had to be made, that the arrest was being made uh, on behalf of uh, our society. It was a good thing to get them off the streets. And so my point being is that there was a number of assumptions that the Phoenix Police Department was built on that had to do with how we treated black people, African Americans, and males in particular, Hispanics in some cases, Indians for sure. Um, and so uh, my charge after being on the police department for not that long was to become a supervisor, a manager, a leader that I could impact some of the assumptions and some of the policies that were built upon these racist assumptions. And so coming up the ranks when I was a sergeant, I could control eight people. When I was a lieutenant, and I made lieutenant very quickly, within five years I was a lieutenant on the Phoenix PD, I could control a shift. When I made captain, I could control a district. When I was a major, I could control half the city. And the great thing about a, a organization that's built on levels and command is that your wishes becomes the way in which people will, officers, subordinates will, will behave. And what you reward, and I'll say this now because this will come up again, what you reward is what you get. And what, what citizens expect from their police department is what they'll get. And so I made it a point, coming up through the ranks of the Phoenix Police Department at every level to um, implement what I consider to be policies that were much more humane, much more, that had a lot more to do with equity and equality and fair treatment, treating people like you would want to be treated and holding police officers accountable. Spent a lot of time in with discipline and various levels. And uh, I did the same thing and we can talk in more detail about that, but I did basically the same thing same thing in each one of the departments that I went to. Uh, I, I was a strong believer in community policing and I was a very strong believer in you reward what you want. And so not only did we reward valor and someone running down an alley and catching a bad guy or someone making great arrest, but we also rewarded people who problem solved, who did things above and beyond uh, in terms of just helping people who were interested in procedural justice as much as, as much as law. In fact, one of the real problems that I try to emphasize, Brooks, is that law and order and law enforcement is very different than policing. That law enforcement emphasizes the word force and policing which is a gerund, which means practice, is a way of, just like if you're a lawyer or a doctor, you're practicing, that you're looking for ways to be better and you're constantly striving to be better. And so we reward it, those people 
who showed. And, and sooner or later, you start to get, when you change policies and you change assumptions and you reward what you're looking for, police officers, like everyone else, uh, will try to please uh, the decision makers. Say one, say one other thing real quick, is that the systems aren't broken. Rotarians, the systems aren't broken. All these systems were designed, <clears throat> excuse me, were designed that way. They're designed to do exactly what, they, what they're doing, and that is to keep white people in power. And to these systems come out of Jim Crow when black, you had a black water fountain and a white water fountain, when you had a black school and a white school, when you had people that uh, was redlined and couldn't get, a, couldn't get a loan from the bank or whatever it was, these systems have been in place for years, and it's time now for us to reimagine these systems and to um, do a better job. It's our time, your time, to step up and to make things different. Um, and as we go along here, if we get an opportunity, I'll talk about more specific changes and reimagining in police departments that have to happen. I'll stop. Okay, I've got a few more questions, but I'm just going to cut it down to one uh, because we've, we've got people uh, other than me asking questions. But I've often heard you, uh, when, when you and I have talked about uh, police procedures, um, and others with police command experience say that the police all over the country have been charged with responding to all kinds of situations that, are not, that, that aren't really things that police are best trained and able to do. And what I'm wondering is, we hear the, the term defund the police, which, which I think is more appropriately uh, downfund the police. Um, is, is, does downfunding the police respond to these things that, that you've talked about and others have talked about, that um, uh, police officers are not the right ones to do? or um, is there a different way to accomplish that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a, actually a multifaceted question. Uh, because in a sense, I do believe that we ought to defund the police or downfund the police, as you just said. Um, because actually what's happened over time is that policing is over assigned. Um, whenever society couldn't figure out what to do with something. They said, give it to the police. Um, and these are the most, many times the most inequipped people to deal with some of the issues that we're faced with in our society. Think about this. At two o'clock in the morning, when there is a problem with a mentally ill person, a person that is struggling mentally, with a family member or with families or whatever, or at two o'clock in the morning when a homeless person is um, starting to unravel. You have a junior police officer because he or she does not have seniority to work days because they are so new. And you have a junior supervisor who doesn't have the seniority to be at a different time. And so these people who are junior and who are not trained in dealing with the homeless or the mentally ill or uh, to deal with the abuse situations that come up or many of the issues that society is dealing with, these are the people who are dealing with it in the middle of the night. And so I've said for years, uh, all those people who love to say, oh, I, I advocate on behalf of kids are... I am interested in dealing with the homeless, or I'm very much interested in dealing with the mentally ill, and I want to be effective. What I want to do is I want to come down and I want to train police officers how to do it. I have a PhD. I'm working from eight to five, and when police officers really need you, you are saying, give us a report and I'll follow up in the morning. The problem is that police officers have been asked to do you know, work with people that they're ill-equipped to work with. Uh, police officers are there to, to seize time 
and to bring violent situations back to normal. Um, they, are, they can't make normal better. Normal is the problem. If you're trying to seize time and bring normal, um, bring situations back to normal. So, Brooks, I would just say that we've been overassigned, police have been overassigned, and it's time now to rethink, not so much defund, but to rethink how and reimagine how police officers and how police departments are assigned and what we expect from them. And many times, many, many times in my career, I've seen us get into trouble, us meaning police departments or policing, wind up in trouble because we're called on to solve issues that we're ill-equipped to solve. And so part of this look, and I'm, I'm, you know, I think that the people who holler for uh, defunding police uh, don't remember the 80s. Uh, they, don't, they don't really remember when crime was really sky high and we went to community policing. But uh, they, they do have a point in the sense that maybe this is an opportunity to reimagine reimagine the kind of partnerships that police officers and police departments have in the community to really solve problems. Okay, um, I've got two questions. Can you please explain what seems to be the outside, outsized power of police unions to deter the firing of bad officers? And a lot of people are making this topic into a political matter. In my opinion, this is a police union problem not who is in office. What do you think? So of the, I'd say top five issues that we as a society will have to deal with when we talk about reimagining policing, I'd say within the top five, dealing with police unions would be one of them. And the reason why that is, is because our politicians, and uh, someone mentioned politicians, uh, over the years, when cities and towns and jurisdictions didn't have money to give raises to police officers, the unions would negotiate with politicians, city councils, mayors, um, and they would um, ask for a 15% raise, 10% raise. And of course, the budgeteers would say, we don't have that kind of money. We can't give you a raise. And so they'll negotiate with the unions. And by the way, there are no police chiefs at the table for the negotiations. It's usually the union meeting with the mayor, meeting with the city council members, meeting with city managers, those kinds of people. The police chief is generally left out of that conversation. And so when they didn't have the money, the unions were smart enough over, I mean, not just here, but I'm talking about across the country, police unions were smart enough to say, well, we understand that you don't have the money, but we would like to have this management prerogative or this management prerogative. We would like to have three of our employees assigned 24 seven um, at the union office to be able to represent um, our fellow officers. We would like to have raises for the union leadership. We would like to have vehicles for the union membership. And we would like to make sure that before a police officer is investigated, um, or fired, or disciplined, that these things would happen. And the city council, city manager, mayors would agree to that. And what we have is a situation An example, when I was a police chief in Detroit, we had an individual on the police department that had been involved in three separate shootings. Each one of them was not a good shooting. They were out of policy. They were, uh, they, people wound up being killed. And when I got there, this person, this officer was still on the police department. And what was really amazing, because we were trying to get rid of him, and the union fought us tooth and nail. What was really interesting is that he was on the supervisor's, the sergeant's list to be promoted. And I wound up having to go to court 
to keep the union and for keeping uh, this person from being promoted to sergeant. And the court told me that the union contract was such that I had to promote this gentleman. And so what happened is that during my tenure in Detroit, there were no promotions because of, if I had one promotion, I had to promote this person. So all of the promotions were uh, interim promotions. They were just temporary promotions, no permanent promotions. So that I wouldn't have to promote this gentleman. But the unions are very powerful and they're powerful not because of just their unions, they're powerful because they have the money and they have the wherewithal to work with decision makers, political decision makers, um, mayors, city council members, and so forth, to just about uh, take away all of the management prerogatives of police chiefs. So one of the ways in which Steve and the other person that asked the question, one of the ways that has to happen is when we reimagine policing, it's got to be done at a federal level. It's got to be done with the Justice Department involved with a, with a consent decree. And it has to be uh, that we are ignoring or retracting some of the uh, management prerogatives that have been over the years. And uh, that's the only way I think it will, it will occur is that we just have to have a consent decree with the government with the federal government to uh, sidestep some of the issues with the unions. Okay. Um, I read there are two things that will make a meaningful impact on black advancement, choice in education and changing black culture to uh, embrace having husbands, a responsible man in black ho households. President Obama tried to stress a man in the house. What are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> like I said, I think that there are, there are many assumptions about uh, why black males are involved in a, are in a situation, situations that they're in. And many times it has to do with what we've talked about and it has to do with the systemic or institutionalized racism that has been built. <clears throat> I know it's easy to look at the surface and say, well, uh, somehow these men don't take care of their families and don't take care of their kids. But when I was police chief in Richmond, there were about seven housing project areas and mostly moms and kids, young men and their moms, which is not a good formula. And Georgia, I would just tell you that the reason why that was is because the institutions that have rewarded black dads, but I'm talking about basically poor people, for not being around. Their, their families do better when they're not there. The welfare system, and it affects white folks too. It, poor white people in many of the places in Appalachia and uh, many of those places, they behave the same way. It's not just black people or not just Hispanic people. They behave the same way because the rules enforces, enforce them to basically not be around. And so what happens is they're not there during the day when the inspections occur because there's a penalty for dads being in the household. There's no penalty if they come at night. There's no penalty when the other people, the, the enforcers aren't around. So um, we've got, that's another one of those systems I said that um, has to be looked at and rethought. Uh, the welfare system, the uh, how people are rewarded for having kids and not taking care of their kids. Um, that's a systemic issue that's got to be addressed. Okay, and uh, also, yeah, you mentioned about uh, education. Education uh, is very, very important for everybody. It's important for black people, important for white people. In fact, I'm hoping that that's what we're doing right now as we're sitting here is that some people become educated about uh, what's really going on uh, with the whole Black Lives Matter issue and how that's been uh, hijacked in a way. But uh, yeah, I just, I believe that education is important. I believe that dads 
black men and families, if we're talking about black people, that's important. Uh, I believe that we need to take a look at the systems to see why is that happening? And why does it continue to happen <clears throat> even when President Obama uh, put programs in place? There are counter programs. There are other situations that causes that. People aren't inherently bad or mean or, or irresponsible. It's the systems that we find ourselves dealing with that causes many of the, the problems. And they're based on some assumptions that are incorrect. And many of the assumptions are racist. Tony writes, um, what will you tell one of your sons if he says he wants to be a policeman? And then my question is, I've often heard something people refer to as the talk that black and brown families um, have to give their sons and daughters as they start to reach their teenage years. What would it take to get to the point where the talk is no longer necessary? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, uh, my son did go into policing and just recently retired from the Phoenix Police Department. Um, and uh, he uh, had a great career. I would say that uh, the talk my parents had with me, I had with him, and I still have young, for some of you that know uh, Felicia and I, we still have uh, three young men that uh, still hang around every once in a while. We haven't been able to run them off yet. Uh, but uh, they just, two of them just turned 21 and one is 18 years old, or soon will be. And we have had the talk many times. We've taken situations that have occurred and said to them, hey, when you're out in the world and you are stopped by a police officer and engaged with a police officer, cooperate. Uh, I would much rather for you to cooperate and to do whatever it is that they're asking you to do at the time than to wind up being dead right. Um, I would prefer that you totally, you know, we, there, we tell them about making sure that their hands are in sight. If a police officer stops them, we talk about making sure that they're, they, when they reach for their wallet, sometimes even having your wallet on your dashboard, um, making sure that you don't have any furtive movement, that kind of thing to give anybody an excuse. Now, uh, many, many police officers, as I said at the outset, are good people. And if you're stopped, they're probably doing exactly what they should be doing. But as I said, there's a chapter that will be written about people that should never have been police officers in the first place. That's one of the things on my top five list that we could talk about is how do we do that? How do we do a better job of selecting police officers that aren't bigoted, that are ignorant in many ways, don't know um, with how to deal with people outside of their own sphere of influence, that kind of thing. And I've seen much of that. And just by chance, that might be one of the police officers that stopped my son. And I want them not to have an excuse to shoot my son or to do something silly. And I've seen of late here in Phoenix, police officers, um, and I, you know, and many times I pity Jerry Williams, the police chief here, who is trying to uh, make some sense of some of the things that police officers do or have done recently. And you just, as a police officer myself, you just, you have to wonder what in the hell were they thinking when they did this, when they created the situation where they couldn't de-escalate it and move away, they then forced the issue. And so I just tell my kids, tell my son, I tell my grandkids, young males, the same thing. And that is police officers um, stop you, comply, and we'll deal with it later. To deal with the uh, inequity later, but I don't want you trying to deal with it out there on the street at, in the heat of the moment. Uh, you were part of a police department in white majority Phoenix, in Richmond, a, cist, uh, a city with 50-50 racial balance, and in, in Detroit, a, a black majority city. Can you compare the police treatment of black citizens in each, in each city. Yeah. And, and let's say brown citizens there too, because we have, we have a lot of uh, 
uh, Hispanic uh, citizens here in Arizona? Absolutely. And uh, Roger, that's a great question. What, what I've seen is that uh, for different reasons, the relationships with the uh, black community or the Hispanic community still different. Here in Phoenix, I think that we like to think, and I think for the most part, we are a leading department in the country. I think that we are, we have most of the officers that are on the police department, I think they have their heart in the right place. They, they would want to. There is a percentage that I don't think so. Um, but here's the problem in Phoenix, that um, the, the more African-American police officers we have, the less those assumptions that I talked about, uh, the biases are, uh, you know, are played out. Um, as a black officer, when I worked South Phoenix or worked in an area that was predominantly black, uh, an expression on a black person's face did not necessarily mean that they were angry or a word that they said didn't mean that that was something that was challenging me as a police officer. Or uh, if we were talking in the street, uh, we, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem for me to stand in the street and talk to him. Uh, I didn't make it an issue to get back up on the sidewalk, let's talk on the sidewalk. In other words, I understood as a black person dealing with black people, I understood that there was a, uh, that the culture is different, that people say, do, behave differently without being a threat. And I also understood as a black police officer dealing with black people, the kinds of things that was really important to them in their culture. What's an insult and what's not an insult um, to that person? Uh, when a guy is in front of his family, things that you don't want to say, um, you don't want to push him to the brink if you don't want to have a fight. And once you escalate that, then you've got a real problem on your hands. In other words, there are just a lot of little um, indignities sometimes that white officers don't quite understand because they come from a different culture. And it's not just policing. It's like that in teach teachers, teachers with um, students. It's like that with all kinds of stuff. And so it's really important, I think it's really important that um, we, under, we have that kind of understanding. Now, so the more African Americans, the more Hispanics, the more Asians, the more women you have on the police department, the less opportunity you have for that to be offended, for people to be offended. Okay, now in Richmond <laughs> and in Detroit, there were predominantly black cities, you still had a problem because you had predominantly black cities with predominantly white police departments. And even in Detroit, the police department was still predominantly white and they still had friction between police departments and the community. And not every officer, I wanna keep reminding everybody that I'm not talking about every officer, but I am talking about officers that um, don't really quite understand um, the culture that they're working in and the people that they're working with and the circumstances that they find people in. I think it's really, really important. One of the things, again, on that top five list is that police officers, all of them, should not be hired with just a high school education. We should have police officers, the, this, the, the job of being a police officer today uh, is so complex. The rules, the laws, the Supreme Court decisions, all of those things are really, really important. And to ha have some person that never went any further than a high school, that never took a sociology class, never thought much about you know, how people interact, never thought about uh, the bigger picture, have a, a larger world view, um, they, they shouldn't be police officers. And so many times in places like Richmond, the cradle of the Confederacy, or Detroit, the chocolate city, Motown, many times the police officers that you have there have been there for a long time, and many of them don't have any kind of idea about a worldview that's inclusive or problem solving that they're there to pro solve problems, that they're there to be a resource, that they're there for the spirit, uh, they're, they're hired in the spirit of service, 
and not in the spirit of being uh, an enforcer or the spirit of being a guardian of the community. If you were the chief of police in Portland, Oregon, and had the authority as you saw fit, what action would you take to quell the insurrection that's arisen there? Well, um, the Portland, Oregon is a really interesting, uh, from a black perspective, is a very interesting situation that's occurred. Uh, I, you, I mentioned earlier that Black Lives Matter is important, and, but it's been hijacked. So let's look at the demographics of Portland. It's like 5% African American. It's like 80 point something percent Caucasian. And then the rest are Asians or Pacific Islanders. Very few black people in Portland, Oregon. If you've ever been there, it's a great city, but it's mostly white. And so the idea that you would have all of these white people in the 50th and 60th day still claiming to uh, be in support of George Floyd and his murder and to destroy buildings, set fires uh, in the name of Black Lives Matter is hijacking the situation. I mean, so from my standpoint, Federal buildings need to be protected. The community needs to be protected. I would not have done what they did in Seattle. That's hijacking the sentiment of what the whole George Floyd issue is about, about equality and about, you know, one of the great things that John Lewis left us with was good trouble, the statement about good trouble, and that it's nonviolent. But this, the protest and about the injustice and the violence against black people have been hijacked by white people and other people, in my, again, from my perspective. Um, now that raising all kinds of concerns, all kinds of fears about what's going on and it's being blamed on Black Lives Matter, all those black people up there. There's no black heart, any black people in Portland. So my, cons my thought about Portland, quite honestly, is that we need to police officers policing in the ways in which we need to do it, which is intelligent, humane, but the rock in the sock. And that is soft to the touch, but very much a solid um, foundation in terms of bringing that whole situation back to normal. And I have said earlier, normal is the problem, but uh, I think that many times in situations like what we're talking about, the uh, protest has been hijacked and that the people who are doing it are different, doing it for very different reasons. In fact, detrimental reasons to the cause. Police misconduct costs us hundreds of millions of dollars a year nationally. In Phoenix alone, it costs just under $3 million a year. We're paying for policing as taxpayers and paying for their mistakes. How do we as taxpayers hold the officers financially accountable so we're not paying for their mistakes? That's a great question too. Uh, first of all, I do think that police officers ought to be held accountable um, just like every other citizen when they are uh, when they're wrong and when they do egregious things, just like in the George Ford Floyd uh, murder. Uh, I believe that police officers ought to be held accountable. I think we're in a very litigious society um, and there will look for the deep pockets, whoever the plaintiffs are, they'll look for the deep pockets. And so they'll always look to the city. But uh, in the past, to be honest about it, to be in the past, police officers, because of the unions, because of contracts, because of uh, sympathy towards police officers, and because honestly, the Supreme Court decision that happened in uh, 1989, I believe, is the Graham versus decision 
that gave police officers almost the right to do just about anything they need to do and be able to justify it uh, when it comes to violence. Um, I think people, are, we've moved away from that a bit. I think people are being held more accountable. Again, of the top five things that need to happen to reimagine police departments would be to hold police officers and police departments more accountable. I believe that in some cases, police supervisors need to be held accountable uh, to some of these egregious things because police supervisors uh, are responsible for the people that work for them and the training that they receive and the documentation of their behavior and their performance. And generally, this is not the first time. It's not the first time. Um, the gentleman that, uh, the officer that killed George Floyd has a long history of being brutal and being um, inappropriate and out of policy. And supervisors and managers needed to have acted on that to the extent that they could. And so when they didn't, I think in some cases they need to be held accountable too. But she's right. Whoever, I mean, the questioner said, you know, lots of, lots of money goes towards um, police um, mistakes or police uh, inequities and lawsuits and so forth. And my, my belief is that they should be held accountable and which makes, uh, should make police departments and police cities and city administrations uh, do a lot more in terms of uh, the training and the exposure that these uh, police officers receive. And, the, and a better selection process as well, selecting better police officers from the beginning. I received a, actually a question from, uh, from someone who lives uh, actually in Vancouver, Washington, across the river from, uh, from Portland. Um, and, and she's asking, uh, Beth Ford, when you say that BLM has been hijacked by white people, do you mean that you believe the protesters in Portland don't believe that Black Lives Matter, even the peaceful protesters? Do you agree with how the Trump administration is using military forces to arrest protesters in Portland? I do believe that um, there is a, uh, a fraction or part of this group that, of course, believe that Black Lives Matter. Black lives do matter. I mean, you know, it's, this is an important uh, it's an important issue. It's an important statement. Um, it's been, people have tried to make it into uh, a lot that is not, you know, they've, uh, they've hooked it up with, you know, socialism. I read uh, some people say about the intent for Black Lives Matter. And it has, in a way, been hijacked, or if you want to say that in a way, is the, the meaning and the direction has been uh, divert it. So I believe that, yeah, there's a fraction of people there in that group, the protests that are legitimate. But I do think that there's a, a larger fraction that is bent on something other than uh, equity for African Americans or for minorities or people of color or, or whatever. And that uh, I don't know from a policing standpoint how burning and looting a federal building has anything to do with Black Lives Matter uh, or for the movement for that matter. And so I believe that that building, just like our buildings here, our federal buildings in Arizona, needs to be protected. That's what law enforcement and policing do. I mean, that's, what, that's part of what we should be doing. Um, and so unfortunately, the president from a political standpoint has decided to send in federal uh, resources. I believe, though, that the local police and local, I'm not just talking about Portland police, but I'm talking about there are many jurisdictions there have the ability uh, to protect those buildings and to um, humanely, but firmly deal with the protesters.